Alabama, now there's you a mixture, holds a Bachelor of Theology and Doctor of Divinity degrees. He offers tremendous uh, insight into masculinity and family relationships, which he gleaned over the last 47 years of walking with the Lord. Amen. Brother Mike, come and minister to us, brother. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Are we on the air? Amen. Amen. I just told someone, I think my friend over there, I said, this lady said to this husband of his, you know, before I married, I thought you were well off. She said, I was. <laughs> All right. Now, this doesn't require, this is not part of the talk, but I thought, well, I won't have a chance to put it on. Our brother Ken Nair over there, where's brother Ken? He was talking about the unique differences between a man and a woman. And I thought you would appreciate this. And I think Ken would like this as well. You've seen that? You don't have to say anything. That's the bottom line. Men like all the buttons, but no, not those ones. All right, now that you've digested that, I can get on to my talk. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's have a word of prayer, shall we? Hallelujah. I usually do that, not just to X, Y, Z, but usually just to find my notes. <laughs> Thou shalt not laugh. Now, Lord, we want to thank you and bless you for your wonderful love. Thank you that you love us and you've called us for such a time as this. This is a special message. And I pray that the words of my mouth and the med meditations of my heart may be acceptable in your sight. Bless the word as it goes forth tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. You know, when God made us, he never made winners or losers. He made choosers. You can choose to win or you can choose to lose. The choice is with you. That choice will determine your character. And your attitude affects your altitude, as I said last night. <clears throat> Tonight my subject is seven reasons why divorce is wrong. Seven reasons why divorce is wrong. I'm hoping I'm going to be, get through them all. <clears throat> now, I've been talking to a number of people during this conference, and for those who are, of you who I haven't talked to, I tell them it's not so much whether the Bible says it or not. That's not the issue. I've taken a long time to find that out. It's whether you love God sufficiently enough to bring your life into line with what God says. Otherwise, you will wrestle with the Scriptures all the time. Why? Because self is on the throne. And I said to a brother once, I said, you know, the greatest sin in the church is this divorce and remarriage. And he looked at me, he says, you're wrong. I said, I'm not. He said, you're wrong. The greatest sin in the church is self on the throne. You see, you die by living to self. You live by dying to self. Seven reasons why divorce is wrong. Now, some of these things are going to overlap because we've all, we're all using the same textbook. But I think repetition increases impression. 
So the first reason why I believe that divorce is wrong, it makes a mockery of your marriage vows. When you got married, the minister said, do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife, to love and to cherish in sickness and health, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer? Will you love her? Will you cherish her? Will you keep true only unto her? As long as you both shall live? And he said, I will. What happened to those vows? We've already seen that vows are very important to God. And some of those verses that we have been seeing, a couple of the brothers have been projecting them there. The one in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, when you make a vow to God, make sure that you pay that vow. Don't make a vow to God and don't pay it. Rather not make a vow than make it and not pay it. And I've told lots of people, I said, look at verse 6. Wherefore shall God be angry at your words and seek to destroy the works of your hand? Now, I pointed a brother once. He was sitting there with his wife. He's, gonna, he's having an affair with some other woman. I said, sir, when you made your vow, you said you'd remain faithful to this woman for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, until death does part. God heard those words. God sealed those vows. And I said, let me read you verse 6. And I said, wherefore shall God be angry at your words and seek to destroy the works of your hands? I said, sir, you divorce your wife. And God is going to work against you to destroy the works of your hands. Oh, eh? Big deal, eh? Yeah. I said, yeah, that's right. Man, everything has gone uphill for that man. He lost his job. The bottom fell off. The exhaust pipe dragged along the ground. He, he was, everything went wrong. To top it all, the girlfriend that he was going out and her daughter were both killed in a head-on collision. Tragic. But the good news is, after about seven years, they both got remarried. Hallelujah. Praise God. They both got remarried. Hallelujah. Wonderful. I'm so blessed and happy to hear that. So it makes a mockery of your vows. And it says there in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 and 37, this is what it says. But I say unto you, Brother Burkett, he brought that out, but I say unto you, but I say unto you that every idle word that man shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. We need to put that in the setting of marriage as well. Don't make idle promises, don't make idle vows before God. In Numbers chapter 30, verse 2, it was already read today. I think Brother uh, Joseph Webb read it. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth, or God will work against you to destroy the works of your hands. I put that in. A vow is a serious thing before God. So when we make our marriage vows, and we break those vows, we are making our marriage vows a mockery. Now when a man vows to a woman, I'll remain faithful to you for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, until death do us part, he is not married. When she makes her vows to him, I will accept that and I will do likewise. For better, for worse, at that moment, they're married. They don't have to get into bed. They're married then. That's the seal of the covenant. And so you make your marriage vows a mockery. The second reason why I believe that marriage is wrong, uh, sorry, that divorce is wrong, correction, divorce is wrong, is because it is a negation of the beautiful Christian teaching of agape love. 
Now, I think it's important for us to understand, and I'll just go through this very quickly, because that's not my whole message. I do have a whole message on this. But if you look at that word love, in the Greek we have a word called eros. That means sexual love, erotic love, romantic love. It's a, an emotional attachment love. That word is not, it's in the Greek, not in the Bible. There's another word for love. It's called phileo. Phileo love is a warm attachment. You can love a brother or love your auntie. You can love someone with passion. It's quite interesting for those who study the Greek and you have a look at uh, uh, John chapter 20 when Jesus said, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Do you agape me? That's the last one I'm going to talk about. And he says, yea, Lord, thou knowest I phileo thee. He said, but, but hold on, I'm asking, do you, do you really agape me? Lord, I, I, I really have a warm attachment. I phileo you. The Lord knew he couldn't say, I got you. That's phileo. There's another word that is also not in the Bible. It's called storge. A kind of family love. I love my granny. I love my mother-in-law. A kind of storge love. The last that I want to talk about, which is I'm honing in on there, is the agape love. Now agape love is the unconditional love of God. God so loved the world. Agape. The highest form of love that is only shed abroad in a man or a woman's heart by the Holy Ghost. You cannot buy it. You cannot work it up. It is a God-given love that is formed in your heart. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is very, very clear. It talks about love. Love, love suffers long and is kind. Love is never, ever irritable or rude or ungainly. Love will never, ever even notice when people do it wrong. Listen to this one. Love, agape, will never, ever keep a record of wrongs. Some of you ladies put those little diaries away. I know so many times that they've got a whole history of stuff. Love never keeps a record of wrongs. Hardly ever even notices if people do it wrong. Love endureth forever. If you have a marriage that has come unstuck, it wasn't agape love. May have been from your son, but not from his, or vice versa. Because love never, ever, 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 ever comes to an end. It keeps on loving and loving and loving and loving. It never, ever ends. That's the secret to a happy marriage. Get the love of God which is shared abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. You take out your keys. You dangle him in front of you, say, if there was agape love in the world, we wouldn't need these keys. All the divorce lawyers, you wouldn't need them. All the ammunition, all the armaments, everything in the world. We wouldn't need these things. Think of the money we could save. Armaments and everything else. Why? It's because there's no agape love in the world. So those four words are interesting. Of course, what I'm talking about is that it is a negation of the beautiful principle of agape love. That's why divorce is wrong. And then the one that I... Let me just drop this in before I get off this point. In, in Isaiah 53 verse 6 it says this. A beautiful verse. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned 
everyone to his own way. There's the problem. We've turned everyone to his own way. The Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. You see, it's a violation of love. We go our own way. Man's will crossing the will of God. Going your own way instead of God's way. All you have to do to be a sinner is to go your own way instead of God's way. I have never yet found a single man or woman who went to the divorce courts because they realized, man, I don't know how my husband can live with such a Jezebel as me. I cannot... They, every one of them, go their own way for their own comforts. It's all self-seeking. So it's a violation of the basic principle of agape love. Love never seeks its own, but always seeks another's wealth, another's comfort. Imagine how marriage would be if every one of us sought how we could please our neighbor, please our partner for his or her good, rather than please ourselves. Oh no, I'm getting rid of her. She doesn't meet my needs. I mean, we started off with fine, but now, oh, no way. She just, she just doesn't meet my needs. So have you ever stopped? Maybe you're, you're barking up the wrong tree. Maybe you should think in terms of how can I meet her needs physically, spiritually, financially, socially, emotionally. These are all thresholds that we need to look at. I do that and when I counsel people. We look at all these different thresholds. Very important. The third reason why divorce is wrong is it is a breaking of the type of Christ and his church that I spoke about last night. Now let me just look at that. Perhaps I'll just, I won't rub off. I'll have to take another one. <clears throat> when we talk about types in the Bible, if you have a fellow walking around here, And on the ground, he sees that. He looks down and he sees that shadow. He said, that shadow must have been cast by something. So he walks along and he bumps into a tree. In theology, this is the type. The shadow is the type. The antitype is the tree. The tree is the substance that casts the shadow. So that's types and shadows, typology in theology, typology. Now, <clears throat> if, as I said last night, the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body every husband needs to be the savior of his little body to wash her by the washing of the water by the word I went through that last night I was preaching in a church in South Africa it was an Indian church and I came to the end of my message I was talking about husband and wife relationships and I said now when this all come, comes under the heading of the types. I said, when a man and a woman get married, he's the head, she is the body. Christ and his church. I said, then when a wife decides she's going to get rid of her husband, she in fact cuts the head off the body. We've got a head bouncing around without a body, and a body bouncing around without a head. And I was talking about this. And I said, now, now, before I close, let me say this, that 
I have a terrible feeling here tonight that there are some murderers in the congregation. I looked. Now, whatever you do, don't look to the left or the right. Just look ahead. Look at the corner of your eye. You may be sitting next to the one. So be careful. And I said, you see, when a wife Decide she's going to divorce her husband or vice versa. You cut the head off the body and divorce equals murder in the sight of God. You may be a murderer tonight. If you've ever contemplated divorce, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You need to repent tonight of being a murderer. Oh, but you don't understand, Brother Gory. I mean, this is it. Yeah, if you have been divorced by a husband and you resisted it, don't come under condemnation. Say, thank you, Jesus. Praise God. But hallelujah, I pray that God will convict that man of being a murderer. I said that in this, this conference, in this uh, talk that I was giving. Nine months later, I was speaking in the same area in Peter Maritzburg. A woman came up to me. She said, Brother Gory, this was just half time. I was doing a whole session there. She said, do you remember the time when you came to that, that uh, assembly and you talked about cutting heads of bodies? She said, man, the Spirit of God so convicted me. You said there's a murderer sitting in this room tonight. And the Spirit of God spoke into my heart. And when you showed there cutting a head off the body, that's like, that's divorce, that, that's murder in the sight of God. God's Spirit spoke to my heart. I went home and I repented to my husband. I said, I'm a murderer. He just about jumped out of his skin. He thought, man, what on earth? I'm a murderer. And she explained the whole thing to him. She did more than that. She asked his forgiveness. She went down to the lawyer's office the next day. She canceled the whole toot. And she said, I want to tell you something. Come here. Hey, there's a husband coming. We're back together. We've fallen in love. I said, oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. God is good. Why? You know the truth. The truth will set you free. Now, here tonight, God wants to reconcile people, wants to put people together. He wants to put heads back on bodies and bodies back on heads. We have a terrible problem. I tell you what, we got a problem, man. We have a problem. When God looks down from heaven, this is what he's seeing. He's seeing a lot of monsters, man. He's seeing, man, he's seeing, he's seeing monsters, all of these. He's seeing this lot, man. He's seeing that lot, heads without bodies, three heads on top of one body, monsters. He's saying, what on earth? Is this the image of God? You let me out of it. I'm not like that. You see, your picture affects your performance. A type. It's a type of Christ in his church. When Joshua, Moses, and all them came through the promised land, uh, sorry, came through the wilderness, they came to a rock. The Lord says, Moses, speak to the rock, bring forth water. Oh, Moshe, he thought he was good. He says, boy, I'll give that rock a hiding. He gave it two clouts. And out shot the water. God says, Moses, you don't go into the promised land. You broke the type. Broke the type? 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says, And they all drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. That rock was not Christ, but that rock was Christ. It was a type. It was a symbol of Christ. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water to refresh the people. How many times was Christ smitten for the sins of the world? He was crucified once. He smote the rock twice. You show that Christ is going to be smitten two times for the sins of the world. You broke the type. You don't go into the promised land. God is very jealous of his types. God is very jealous of his types. Who took the children of Israel into the promised land? Why didn't Moses? One, because he's disobedient. I'll give you another type. I'll give you another beautiful truth. 
The law was given by Moses. Moses typified the law, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Another name for Jesus is Yeshua, Joshua. Joshua takes you into the promised land, not the law. Moses can't take you into the promised land. That's good, isn't it? It's not original. I found it in the book. <laughs> Got to give credit where credit is due. God is very jealous of his types. And marriage is a type of Christ and his church. And Jesus never divorced his church. Never. Hallelujah. And he is a God of reconciliation. He wants to put heads back onto bodies, bodies back onto heads. He wants people to humble themselves and repent. Yeah, we've all got our reasons why. Well, Brother God, you don't know how much this man hurt me, and I got biblical grounds for divorce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go and see Joseph Webb. He'll tell you about it. <laughs> Go and buy his book. Man. The fourth reason why I believe that divorce is wrong is because the parties concerned go to law before the unjust. And didn't Paul say something about that? Paul says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1, 6, 7, and 8, Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? But brother goes to, with brother to law and that before the unjust? There's utterly a fault amongst you. Can't you deal with these areas in the church? So, this is what I say. If I have to, got it written down here. Let me read it so I don't get it wrong. If we have to violate God's law to further our ends, then our ends should go no further. Stop divorce proceedings. You don't have to go to law before the unjust. Show me, I know possibly in the States you invent all sorts of things here. You've probably got sort of self-packaged divorce kits and put one drop here and add water or whatever. I don't know, but you got them. But I think just practically every single person who's gone through a divorce has gone through the legal divorce system. And they go before the unjust. And they're lining their pockets with your money to get your head cut off and have a body bouncing around without a head and a head bouncing out of the body and two heads on top of it. No, 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 it's wrong. Not God's way. We don't want that. Amen, Brother Gory. Thank you. Yes, I like it. Brother Webb's right. He said, you can say amen or amy or, or say me or whatever. I don't know. Yes. The fifth point why I believe that divorces are wrong, it destroys the biblical principle of covering. Of covering. Now, many of you know I come from South Africa. I'm sorry I'm using up all your... No, I could possibly use this here. Yeah. All righty. I watched a video filmed by some Dutch filmmaker many years ago in South Africa on television. And it showed a mother rhino, a big, massive rhino with the horns there, and a little baby rhino calf about that size. And it was filmed at night, and they said, watch, the wild, the pack of wild dogs are after that baby. And they all came around, and they are vicious, terrible things. Talk about Tasmanian devils. They haven't got a patch on this lot. And these things come around. They are vicious. They'll tear a, an animal apart while it's running. It's terrible. And they were after this little rhino. And they came around, and the whole idea was to try and get the little rhino away from the mother. And they, he said, just watch them. And they tried to, and the mother came, look at it, oh, and they all scattered. And the little, little thing came up, say, and then they tried again, and then the mother, and off they scattered. And they did that time and time again, and they said, watch, they will get it. But for them to get that rhino, they have to separate it from under the covering of the mother. And when they get it away, they'll get it. And they killed it. Destroyed it. You see, God 
operates under the principle of covering. And this covering principle is not to stop us from having fun, but to prevent us from being hurt. So the wife stays under the covering, and the children stay under the covering, and the husband becomes the covering, and when it rains, they're under the protection. Now the devil knows. He's smart. He's stupid too, but he's smart. He wants to get if he is to get to the wife, he must get her out from under the covering. Because the devil operates outside of the covering principle, out here. So you show me one little 12-year-old girl who got herself pregnant, or one 14-year-old guy got himself into drugs, and I'll show you a little family, the man and the woman, the little boy or the girl, they came out from under covering first, and that's where the devil's at then. So God operates under covering, the covering principle. It's all through the Bible. You see it in families. You see the father, the mother, etc. While she stays under the covering, she stays under protection. Now let me say to all you ladies, and some of, the, some of you may agree with me. If you don't, you're still wrong. Come and see me afterwards. <laughs> if you are divorced from your husband, you see that ring, and he's your proper husband. Not one of the other heads bouncing around that didn't belong to you, putting on top of you. No, no, no. You keep your ring on. It's part of your covering. It's part of your covering. And you see that every day and say, thank you, Jesus, I'm still a married woman. You don't go back to your maiden name. No, 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 no. You stay under the covering. You don't go into chat rooms on the, on the, the internet. No, no, no. Out of bounds. No, out of bounds. You don't go there. That's just, you don't go to single clubs, but you're not single. And unfortunately, many of these churches are cesspools of licentiousness. Cesspools. They get the emotions all bubbling, and when the emotions increase, judgment and resistance decreases. And I tell you what, you'll have a word of knowledge. And a brother will say, Yea, 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 thus saith the Lord. Yea, my sister, my handmaiden. Yea, pray. You tell me, yea, yea, jump in the bay. I don't want to hear that. I'm a married woman. Amen. The reason why he's yea, yeaing, he's got his eyes on you. Yeah. So we need to stay under the covering principle. It's important for husbands to be under covering... To Husbands be undercover? Yeah. Husbands must be undercover. I said to a lady once, I said, now, who's your head? Oh, she says, Christ. I said, no, your husband. I said to him, who's your head, sir? Well, he didn't know. He wasn't so sure about that. So I said, the Bible says the head of every man is Christ. Now, sir, you stay under your covering and submit to your head, and your wife will submit to you who are under the covering of your head. And if you come under the covering of your head, and she submits to you who is under the covering of your head, oh, there'll be great security there. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, amen. That's it. Amen. Amen. So it destroys the principle of covering. Now, sometimes... His nibs moves away. Or he's such a hopeless covering, there's holes all over here. He doesn't lead in spiritually. He's not a prophet, priest, or king. And, uh, you know, and the rain starts coming through here. And then they think, hey, man, I better get out of here. It's just like you're saying, you know what? We, we had the terrible leaks in our roof in the church. So we all moved out and went to another denomination. Went to the Baptists. They believe in baptism by birth, not sprinkling. So we went to them. Say, no, 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 no. What you do, if the, leak, if the roof is leaking, you roll up your sleeves and you get on the roof and you patch up the holes and you get back under the covering. That's what you need to do. That's the virtuous woman of Proverbs 31 who can know how to get on the roof, patch up the covering, and then come under the covering again. It's a, it's a process and, and a very dignified way of doing it. Because... Now, this is not in my notes right now, but I'm going to say it. And it's something we all need to learn. It's vitally important. 
When a man, please listen with both ears and two nostrils, it's very important. When a man feels threatened in any way, shape, or form, he'll resort to two different reactions. One, he will become a dictator. Or two, he'll become an abdicator. And dictator will lock up the keys of your car. He won't let you phone your mother. He'll embarrass you in public. He'll hit, he'll slap you. He'll give, stop, stop. I wonder why he's doing that. He's feeling threatened somewhere. Now, oh, the virtuous woman says, Lord, teach me how to reduce the threat threshold so that I don't pose a threat to him. Some women are so smart and their husbands so dumb and men are slow learners, some of us, slow learners, and, and if you've always got the answer, he's going to feel threatened. If you've got a PhD and a couple of degrees and he's just got a standard eight education or something, he's going to naturally feel threatened. Learn the art. Of, as a woman, of climbing down to your position of strength to get underneath him and by God's grace to lift him to his position of strength. You climb down to strength, he climbs up to strength. You climb up to weakness, he climbs down to weakness. Think about it. Getting very quiet. Anyone out there? Are there? Okay. So the principle of covering is vitally important. Now the sixth point, I'm going to give you an object lesson. And you're never going to forget it all the days of your life. God won't let you. And it's going to be in your mind, and you're going to teach it to your children, and you're going to teach it to your grandchildren, and you're going to say, thank you, Lord. This was given to me by God, absolutely from the Lord. Simple. Even a New Zealand have found it out. It's very simple. I get people who come to me, and they say, I'm going to divorce her. Sorry, I've had it. I'm not, I, I, I said, how long have you been married, sir? Come and see me. So both of them come in there, she sits there and she's very upset and whatever, and he's sitting there as bold as a lion, and say, so how long have you been married? Fifteen years. I said, all right. And you? Fifteen years. Oh, same. Yeah, same. I said, now listen. Listen. I said, just take this... Uh, Salt. Got it from the table. Salt. Okay? Put it in there. Now, never going to forget this. You want to hone in, just hone right in here. Hone in. So, I said, okay. Yes, sir? You are Mr. Salt. Will you just take this here? And he holds this there. I said, now you are Miss Sugar. Will you just hold us here? Okay. Good, that's not. Nice. Uh, but then a little tear <laughs> rolls down her cheek. I said, do you remember that day? Dearly beloved, we are gathered together in the sight of God to witness the join together of this man and this woman in holy matrimony. If any of you have any just cause why they should not be joined together, let them now speak or ever hold your peace. Will you, Georgie, whatever, take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife, to love and to cherish in sickness and health? For better, for worse, for richer, for poor, will you love her, comfort her, keep true only unto her, forsaking all other. Keep true only unto her as, both, as long as you both shall live. And he says, oh, I said, what did you say, sir? He said, I, I, said, I, I will. Well, I do. So I said, oh, will you? It's the wrong one. Will you please just put the salt in it? Yes, okay. 
Now, I said, now, when they asked you, will you make these vows? Will you take this man to be your lawfully wedded husband, to love and to cherish sickness, health, till death do us part? What did you say? Oh, well. All right. Put it in there. Oops. I said, now that which God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. I pronounce you husband and wife in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. They are now no longer twain, and but one flesh. I said, sir, now you want after 15 years to get married, I mean get divorced? All right, Brother Lorne, will you, will you just take the salt out of there? Please just take the salt out there. Now you don't even take your glasses off, you won't do it. Will you take the sugar off, take the sugar out there? And they laugh. They said, I can't do it. I said, maybe it's too, too early. Hold on. We, we'll, we'll ask you a little later. About half an hour later. I said, oh, by the way, can you take the sugar? I said, you see these two elements that were separate before have now dissolved. A chemical reaction has taken place and they've dissolved into oneness. That's the picture of marriage. You can't take the salt out. You can't take the sugar out. What are you trying to do messing with God's salt and sugar solution? I asked a lady that once, and she was married and uh, married to a divorcee, and I didn't tell her anything about it. She came to one of my seminars, and I said that, and she came, she couldn't wait to see me. And she came to see me, she says, she says, Brother Gory, you remember you did that glass thing, you know, with a, with a bit of salt and sugar? I said, yes, 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 yes. She says, man, and I was waiting for the Lord to tell her. She said, when you said that, the Holy Spirit came like a thundercracker and said, what are you doing getting mixed up in someone else's salt and sugar solution? I said, yep, she's ready for it. And I told her about it. You see, you'll never forget that. You better not. You show it to your children. Sit around the breakfast table or the lunch table and say, hey, okay, now, Georgie, you're going to get married to Cindy over here. Nah, nah. Yeah, no, come on, just you take a salt and sugar and you can have an object lesson right there at the table. That's powerful. You'd never take the salt out. You're not going to take the sugar out. There's a chemical reaction. They've dissolved to become one. And you're not going to divide that one because one is the indivisible number, right? So that's the sixth point. When you enter into covenant, you enter into a relationship that bonds you together and dissolves into oneness the salt and the sugar. And God says he hates divorce in Malachi chapter 2. Now we've got to learn to hate what God hates. We've got to learn to love what God loves. We've got to learn to make his friends our friends, his truths our truths, his doctrine our doctrine, his enemies our enemies. We've got to learn to do that. And sometimes it's not easy. But we need to do it. That's my sixth point. The seventh point is reasons why divorce is wrong is because it tends to shorten one's life. What? Yep. Sen tends to shorten one's life. The Japanese Institute of Population Problems of the Ministry of Health and Welfare conducted a survey and statistical study to establish the life expectancy of divorced people. They found out that life expectancy for divorced people was shorter than that of those who remained married. The study involved four groups. Married, divorced, one spouse deceased, and never married. Life expectancy was found to be longest for men and women who remained married. Divorced women had a life expectancy that was five years shorter and as much as 12 years shorter for divorced men. Eight times as many divorced men suicided than did married men. Divorcees are very often restless 
And this is very important to understand this. Divorcees are often very restless and suffer from great guilt, bitterness, and confusion over God's will. Now, I'm talking about divorcees. For those of you who are standers, and you're standing for the covenant of your marriage, you possibly didn't have much say in it. He divorced you. You didn't divorce him. So I don't want you to live under condemnation, but I'm just reading what the statistics say. The reason for this, the reason why they suffer from great guilt and bitterness and confusion over God's will. Now this is a very important thing. Listen to this. The reason for this is that they persist in trying to justify what God has condemned. What often adds to their confusion is the fact that their minds have gained approval for something which their spirits are telling them is wrong. It's very important. Now you hear people, you hear some would-be good preachers say, now, come to the altar, come to the altar. I believe the Spirit is moving tonight. Come to the altar. Now I want you to just raise your hands, and I want you just to wait on the Lord. Just blank out anything in your mind. No distraction, just my, make your mind blank. Make your mind blank, and God is going to speak to you. <laughs> of sights. Not going to happen that way. The devil's going to speak to you. You don't make your mind blank. Because God speaks to you through the spirit, not through the mind. You must understand that. The mind is part of the emotion. The mind, the emotion, the will, and the intellect. That makes up the soulish area of man. God does not speak to man through his mind. The mind and the soul and spirit and all that come together later on. But God speaks to us through the spirit. And what I'm saying here is this, that there's often confusion because in the emotional their emotions have given credence for something that their spirits deep down inside are telling him is wrong. They shouldn't do it. There's something wrong. And so, those are the seven reasons why I believe. There's, I've got 12 of them, but I'm just going to leave it with seven tonight. There's seven reasons why I believe that divorce is wrong. Now, I do believe this, and I'll come back to this shortly. There may be some of you here tonight that are feeling a little bit hurt, feeling a little bit bruised. You didn't have that much to do with the divorce. I've said it already, i say it again. Don't live under condemn condemnation. Make sure that you, you don't walk around and say, well, I, I, I'm a divorcee. No, 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 no. You can say my marriage has failed, but now I'm a rebuilder. I'm rebuilding my relationship with God. I'm rebuilding my relationship with my husband. I said earlier on during that prayer, and I'll say it again for those of you who didn't get it. In Proverbs 16 verse 7, I find that this is the way that it should be. If that's God, and that's Mary, and that's John, and John has moved out, cut the head off or cut the body off, the Bible says in Proverbs 16, verse 7, When a man's ways please the Lord, he, the Lord, makes the enemy to be at peace with him. When a man's ways please the Lord. So what I want you to do, I want you to hook up with God. And there is nothing, there is nothing that his nearness will not fix in your life. You get close to him and press it and say, Lord, if there's anything, my daughter's prayer, Lord Jesus, if there's anything in my heart and in my life that displeases you, please reveal it to me and help me to get it out of my life. If I was the one that caused problems in the marriage and he eventually divorced me, maybe I came across too strong for him. Never too late to do right. Say, God, please forgive me for that. But God, I want to press it into you. God says, how's your tithing? My tithing? Now, you may be robbing from God. You have for the last 10, 15 years. Will a man rob God? Lord, let me get my tithing right. Some of you need to hear that message tonight. You need to get your tithing right. God, that pleases you. I know that pleases you. 
God, I have been very negligent in that area. Please, Lord, help me to get that right. How's your attitude toward your parents? How's your attitude? Just get all that right. Any bitterness, resentment, whatever, get it right. When a man's ways begin to please God, something happens in the heavenlies and he begins to work on the enemy to bring them back to you. Amen? It works. I promise you it works. That's the way God says it must be. Stop trying to send her roses. You're 25 years too late. Don't send her love letters that's just going to drive her up the wall. She doesn't want that. You just get alone with God. Say, Lord, I'm sorry this has happened. It's cutting heads off bodies and bodies off heads. It's violating the type and agape love and everything. I can see that, Lord. But I say sorry for my part that I had to play in it. And it takes two to tango didn't just happen by itself. There's usually enough blame to go around. But those of you brave women and brave men standing for your covenant, get to Proverbs 16, verse 7, and say, God, I want to really get right with you. As, as Brother Stephen Wilcox said today, at the end of his talk this afternoon, he said the real bottom line is, get right with God. Get right with God. Get your heart. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. Divorces only happen when the stubborn wills of men and women take preeminence over the will of God. That's amen. He does. Amen. That's when it happens. I'm going to do my thing. Yes, yes, yes. Proverbs, uh, in Isaiah 53 verse 6 says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. I preach a message about the unknown God. And I saw an altar to the unknown God. And Paul says, whom you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. And from there I twist it and I bring it back to self. I said that's the unknown God in every man's life. Whom you worship, him declare I unto you. Every sin that can ever be committed can be attributed to the root of self. Self is on the throne. And that is one of the hardest things in all of our lives. And some of you possibly here tonight are still saying, I have my rights. Well, let your rights die. And when you sacrifice your rights and say, God, I only want to do your will, something will happen in your life. And you walk out from this place say, God, I can see the altar to the unknown God. Self has been on the throne, demanding its rights, demanding its way. Why shouldn't I be happy? That's come across very strongly out of this conference. You don't have the right to be happy. You have the right to be holy. And when you're holy, God will fill you with happiness. Those who seek for happiness very rarely find it. This happiness is a byproduct of righteous living. Amen? So let us get our hearts around this thing and let us say, Lord, if there's anything in my life, those of you who would like to do it again, put your hand on your heart. And as I end today, say, Jesus, you're welcome in my heart. If there's anything in my life that displeases you, please, Lord, Reveal it to me and help me to get it out of my life. Help me to know how to forgive from my heart. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. God bless you all. That is the end of my message. My wife will be proud of me. I finished on time. Ooh, man.